me at Jello, Jello. You had me at Jello. You had me at Jello. Oh, you had me at Jello. Hi, everybody. Five o'clock on a Friday again. Boy, they roll around fast sometimes. And you know the drill by now. Before we get out our instruments to practice, practice, we're going to pause for a moment of just inspiration and just kind of getting to know various cello players in the world through an edition of Cello Chat. With me today is Alexandra Kunda. How are you doing today, Alexandra? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really quite well, especially considering how busy it is just before Thanksgiving. You know, we're all looking forward to Thanksgiving, but there's still the same amount of stuff to be done, isn't there? <laughs> yep. All right. Well, audience members, Alexandra is a freshman at UW-Whitewater in both cello and chemistry, another double major. So, Alexandra, if you would tell the audience, like, how did you... How did your life path lead you to this point? How did you pick cello in the first place? How did you get where you are? So I did not start my music journey on cello. I started with Suzuki on violin and carried through that through elementary school and through middle school as well. But when I arrived at middle school, we my grade had no cellists available at all. And so I was just kind of up to it to say, like, I'll, I can teach myself in the practice room. So while everyone else was pl like playing orchestra music, I was constantly learning from YouTube videos and from Suzuki books all on my own. And since then, I, I've done MISO since third grade. And eventually in high school, I decided to do cello as my main MISO instrument. It was in senior symphony for two years. It's been an interesting time and has also forced me to think about while I understand how to do things as a cellist, it's also nice and important to think about how violinists would interpret that as well. So I try to focus on trying to incorporate both styles of playing into my cello playing. So That's excellent. I think, I mean, George Nykrug, for example, one of my former teachers was well, he was many things. He taught many people who weren't cellists, and he readily admitted to being heavily influenced by violin approaches to playing. And part of the reason he gave was because the violin has had so much longer of a history as a solo instrument that there's just copious amounts written by all manner of great minds on the subject, and much smaller amounts in the smaller period of time that the cello and bass and viola have been solo instruments. So I'm just kind of curious, Do what are your top couple of uh, most standout differences in terms of the technique of playing violin versus cello? I've noticed as I started playing, as I learned cello, I realized my left hand was a lot looser than it was on violin. So that oftentimes carried over. But then also my right bow hold was very nice and comfortable on violin. So I had to work on bringing that over to cello as well. And also just trying how to interpret up bows and down bows because gravity helps with violin, but it doesn't really help with cello. So I'm trying to work on that as well right now, so. Great answer. <laughs> and then the tie-in also with chemistry. What uh, what led you to a love, an equal or similar love of chemistry? Chemistry was my class during quarantine that I could research. And I also researched about music and chemistry. And it was just a joy to work with. And while going through quarantine, I realized that I, my goal was to become a musician in the MSO at some point. But with how sh everything shut down, I wanted a more reliable job that could still carry on. But I also want to focus my music playing for weddings and more enjoyable things for other people. So, so it's more reliable on me as well. So, Great. There are many, many people in the country and in the world who have found a way 
to balance interests like that. And I know you're going to be <laughs> another one, which is Thank great. You. <laughs> so now, as with other of the current students, I have given you a list of some of the questions I frequently get either through the website or in person when I go out by myself or with uh, Maestro Ramakers or uh, Ms. Kelso or Townsend. Uh, so ask away. Um, the first topic I would like to discuss is when to incorporate musicality into a solo repertoire or even an orchestra piece that we're working on. So, Yeah, I love that question. It's interesting how some people will just gravitate towards the thing like uh, what instrument you play, what's your favorite piece and, and everything. And then you'll get a rather deep question like that. I, I enjoy the variety of questions that one always encounters. And that's a particularly good one, I think. Um, I would have to say absolutely from the very beginning, from the very beginning. I mean, there are definitely people, there are musicians who, and maybe in some ways it's the default approach is to think, well, I'm going to learn the notes and the rhythms, and then I'll go on to the higher levels of, okay, now what does it all mean? I think sometimes an actor might go, okay, I've gonna, got these lines I have to learn. And then, all right, well, what is my character feeling? And, and that sort of thing. But really, I think there are three big reasons why I don't just say as early as possible, but really from the beginning. One of them is from an efficiency standpoint. There are a number of technical aspects of how you're going to do bow distribution or what fingering you're going to choose, et cetera, that if you're just thinking, well, I just want to learn the notes and the rhythm, you learn it one way. And then later when you find out, oh, wow, I really hear the phrase is going to this, or no, I even want to do more here or, or whatever, all those things influence particularly your bow, but also things like fingering choices. And so now you some not infrequently find yourself having to undo previous decisions and and relearn aspects of it. So there's that very practical consideration. And then from the audience's standpoint, and in the end, we really should be about convincing the audience, conveying to the audience our interpretation. I think that the later we wait to add our musical thoughts, the more it seems like a cake in which you forgot to put in sugar in the first place. I think one of the previous interviewees used that, I'm using Eric Miller's analogy, but I love that one, of um, that if you forgot to put the sugar in the cake and then you just sprinkle a whole bunch of powdered <laughs> sugar or whatever kind on the outside, it's just, it's not the same. And I think, We've all run across that in several arts where if the interpretation seems like almost like an afterthought, it kind of comes across as not, not only not natural, but sometimes not genuine, even if we are earnest and genuine, you know? Mm -hmm. So we really want it to be the best way to make sure that it is from the heart and that it comes across that way is to be thinking about that musical goal from the very get-go. And then finally, here's another one that maybe doesn't get mentioned all the time, but I think is very important as well. Sometimes we have other issues, like when I go out on stage, my, I, you know, I second guess myself or my conscious brain is very uh, distractible or, or I don't know, things where people have a hard time managing what their conscious brain is supposed to do in the spotlights and under the effects of all the adrenaline and such. And I think when we, when we add that musical interpretation from the very, very beginning, we know what to do with our conscious brain. You know, we're thinking about the meaning. And if you happen to miss a note here or there, whatever, whatever. It's like when you're trying to convince a friend of your position on this or that or the other, how you about your favorite movie and what, or whatever and you're focused on the meaning. And if you stumble over a word, it doesn't distract you from your, your eye is on the ball of that meaning. 
And I think when we go out on stage and our conscious brain is really, really focused on the meaning that we want to convey to the audience, it's a lot easier to keep it from worrying about, oh my gosh, what's this next note? Oh my gosh, you know, is, what am I going to do with, if, I, if I start to run out of bow or whatever little kind of demons creep into our thoughts. So that's, I do like that question a lot. What's the next one? I think also with musicality, I often hear the word bow choreography, and I'm a little, con I, this is a more personal one, but I'm a little confused as to what that is and would like to learn more. Learn yes, more, sorry. <laughs> that, that's great. Right, right. Um, I'm not sure that everybody's choice of word is choreography. I know it's my favorite because, I don't know, there's just a certain amount of poet in, you know, like poetry is one of the arts and I think it often will creep into the other arts. And I say it's welcome to creep into as many as it wants. So even thinking about where to put our left hand and thinking of that as cello geography, making the analogy to geography, but even more so with the bow of thinking about, we're not just moving it this far this way and this far that way but we're choreographing it. And if you ever get to see the choreographer work with the dance troupe and, and describe how they're not just to do four of these and then do four of those, but the way that they're supposed to fuse them and incorporate this into that and the way that they will talk about uh, making these motions flow together, I think is very much like what I like to think about when I'm doing bow choreography. But in a nutshell, bow distribution is one of those things that I think a lot of young people don't necessarily put as a priority in their practicing. Um, you just kind of really behooves us to carve out time to think about bow choreography, that the fast bows can be super fast when necessary. And the slow bows can be incredibly, incredibly slow when necessary. And uh, of course, you know, the best way to make sure that it's not just our own brain thinking, okay, yeah, that was even faster, is to get that metronome out and, and see just how quickly are you moving it or how slowly. Um, from my perspective, the author, out of everything that I've ever looked at, the author with the best exercises related to bow distribution is Christopher Bunting. I love Christopher Bunting's books. Um, for you, I can lend them, but for the for the viewer, I should be sure to post them on along with this video, links to things about you know, by Christopher Bunting. One of the things that's great about the way that Bunting has us work on bow distribution is he always combines it with dynamics as well, because hardly ever are those two things independent variables. And then also, he does a very good job. He's not the only one, but he is among the people who does a really good job of talking about the link between bow placement and bow distribution. Because when, if a person thinks, oh, I have to move my bow slowly, and they're doing it with their own muscles. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, that can really sound <laughs> constrained and, and make the audience claustrophobic. Oh, dear, oh, dear, they're going so slowly. But when you push the bow to the point where the friction of the string slows you down, as though you are controlling the density of the atmosphere through which you're moving, why, then it sounds perfectly natural. You know, somebody trying to run through water is not feeling tense at all, but the water is only letting them move as, as fast as that density will allow them to move. So um, that's just one of those things where, yeah, it, it definitely is among my top, 10 favorite things in the, you know, as early on as possible in working with the student to get them to incorporate into their warm up routine in a deliberate and intentional manner. 
And one last thing on that, because it's so important. And this is another thing that not only Christopher Bunting, but but Bunting does as well. I'm a very big fan of his, where he would not only encourage people to divide the bow into four quarters, but he would have specific exercises to kind of make you go from quarter to quarter so that when you're thinking about, oh, am I bowing here or here? You're not just kind of thinking of the bow as a continuum, but thinking of it more categorically. Because I think the brain just, there are a lot of ways in which the brain responds better to categories. Even if later on you nuance them together, but early stages, it's uh, clearer. The concept makes more sense if it's categories. Mm -hmm. Good question. I think also another question is that when we're starting to learn a certain piece, like when I learned the Jewish prayer by Black, one big thing I was constantly reminded of is that you have to prepare your bow arm. I also, I really struggled with that. And I wanted to know if there are certain tips that we can learn to start preparing for whether it's shifts or bow changes. So. Right. You know, there are so many things that we do in life where we prepare the next thing without even thinking about it. If if you think about the way that you walk, there's always the seeds of the next step in the way that you took the previous step. It's a constant process of preparing the next motion. Um so to try to just make that as built in of a way of playing, really with both hands, is another thing that is worth setting aside some time and conscious effort on. Personally, you know, like when we're working on repertoire, we are thinking, oh, I've got to get this shift in tune. Or, you know, you're just trying to think about how can I best convey the things that the composer has on the page? But that's where either the warm up routine or a summer where you don't necessarily have it chock full of repertoire already can be a great time to try to improve your game of preparing motions on a regular basis. And I, I think that that is another way that if you were inclined to do so, you could take, uh, I think, your and a num quite a number of cellists' tendencies to know the benefits of recording themselves. If you video record yourself and you press pause right before you're about to make, make the next motion, it can be very apparent whether the seeds of the next motion were there or not. You know what I mean? Or whether it was just kind of out of the blue. And you just press pause right there. And you see, uh oh, no, I still haven't unlocked this and I'm still tense here and everything. And so then that starts to stay in your mind's eye and you start to see things like those slow motion replays of the, the sports games where that person just made that bad and then caught it just in time or something like that. And there, when we watch it in slow motion, it makes perfect sense to see all of everything that's happening being prepared by the preceding thing. Um, and then along similar lines, maybe one other thing to keep in mind is the difference between fast technique and slow technique. Because when we do, when we do slow technique, when we move very slowly, like in an adagio, there can be times when our balance is totally centered on the finger that we're on. And then we shift the balance to the next finger and then we shift it to the next. So in some respects, it's it does not necessarily look or feel like we are constantly moving that the, the balance in this case or whatever it is to prepare the next thing. But in, in fast technique, um, you know, sometimes you, you have to kind of choose a balance that's in the center, the average of what the fingers are doing. But in some other respects, when you watch something in being played by whoever your favorite performer is in fast technique, you can almost 
in some respects, see better how every every next motion is being preceded, uh, you know, prepared by the the preceding one. Um, but basically, in the end, what it's going to boil down to is unlocking every time that our our thumb or or anything else locks and refuses to give then we have muscles fighting other muscles and and it's not going to be a prepared motion um yeah you know it's it's it takes patience there are certain of our habits that if they don't come immediately you really have to be patient with yourself like trying to change your vibrato or something it doesn't necessarily happen overnight you have to be more stubborn than you have it <laughs> <laughs> Um, the last question I wanted to ask is that, obviously, as there are more social media, we typically see the amazing cello prodigies and everything. And I think, especially what me, when I try to practice, I, I kind of get motivated, but then burnt out going, why can't I do that as great as they can? So I think just a big question is how do like... How do us cellists like kind of try to fight that perfectionist mind and just kind of roll with how things are going? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that kind of breaks down into two separate questions mm -hmm. because trying to see, wow, that person's amazing and I'm not there yet. And to try to map out a way to get from where you are to where that person is. That's kind of one thing, like looking up that whole mountain and saying, really, I'm supposed to get up there. And then you see these steps. Oh, after I take a million of these steps, I will be up there. They're each one, one foot at a time, breaking it down. <clears throat> but the actual thing about perfectionism, I really think that perfectionism is not a good thing. I think that it can be one of the most crippling things to go out on stage and have the voice in your head be expecting, demanding that everything be perfect. Uh, you know, that's actually one of the earlier discussions this, this semester was about, hang on a second. But it prompted me to think of it. This the Golf is Not a Game of Perfect by Bob Rotella. It's one of these books where it's not nearly as famous in the music world, to my knowledge, as the inner game of tennis. But it, it, it does a wonderful job about thinking how to think about our imperfections, you know, and that because sometimes we hear, OK, well, you learn from mistakes, eh, but I still don't want to make mistakes in the first place. But when you watch a player who's just totally comfortable on stage, in a way, their comfort level with the possibility of a mistake is such that it is its own, it, I mean, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is its own antidote. If you go out on stage and you're like, well, if I play a wrong note and I keep a straight face, as far as they know, I'm playing a different edition. You know what I mean? <laughs> there can be times like that, that afterwards they can say, oh, my word, that was absolutely perfect. And if you don't say, are you kidding me? Didn't you hear me play the C natural <laughs> instead of the shoots? You know, which we're, we, we you can't do that. <laughs> say thank you very much. But they really mean it. They really mean that you were able to make them forget about it. If they noticed it in the first place, you made them forget about it. And that is a mindset thing. And I'm not saying that that happens overnight either, but I'm saying that that mindset is the opposite of perfectionism. It is a willingness to say, this is a, a process of having my eye on a goal and thinking about how I want to best get to that goal. And it's not about trying to create some sort of a, almost like a museum piece of, of this thing that we're going to call perfection with a capital P, that if it's not just so, then it's a disaster. Oh, what a recipe for, for high anxiety on stage. 
But to the to the first part, going back to the first part, everybody out there has my sympathy if they want it. As far as how I think it's just in some ways in human nature that a lot of people think, okay, there's that, and I'm here. All right, I practiced for an hour. Why am I not there yet? You know what I mean? <laughs> so coming up with realistic expectations as to here are the things that I have to do to get from here to there, and then having just the will and the persistence to get there. On the other hand, as a former, not only George Nykrupp student, Phyllis Young student, Evan Tonsing student, there's also something to be said for not necessarily thinking, oh, well, it's going to take me 10,000 hours to get to being an expert or a master. Because all of them and other teachers as well knew that if you were truly willing to try different ways, categorically different ways to approach the instrument, you can really, it's like cheating. It's like cutting in line. You can jump ahead by 500 hours, 1,000 hours um, by just being willing to totally rethink the way that you've always assumed was a relationship between uh, the back and the shoulder or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So those shortcuts exist. I'm not saying that those little like practice wormholes are easy to find either. They often take a lot of mental concentration and, and practice and focus. But at the same time, that's not the same as feeling like, well, if I want to get there eventually, that makes me a perfectionist. You know, I can still embrace the fact that from time to time, I might play a wrong note, but it's not going to throw me off. If I if I keep a straight face, maybe I even corroborate it and I do that extra little uh, note later and people think, well, oh, Alexandra's ornamenting. <laughs> uh, these are very good questions. I like I like these. Um, and it's always fun. I was just, I just got to be, I don't know if you know or not, if I mentioned to you or not, but in back in Oklahoma not long ago, and seeing where, after having just mentioned Evan Tonsing, seeing where Scott Jackson is keeping Tonsing's tradition alive there too. And and there too, they had a bunch of very good questions. And now I need to write them down and make sure and add them to the list to be asked on a future cello chat as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Alexandra, and good luck with the remainder of the semester, finals in both <laughs> subjects, and then um, and then the remainder of your your studies thereafter. It's exciting times, isn't it? Of course. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> And best of luck to you out there as well. Happy practicing all weekend and the rest of the week. After that, we'll see you 5 o'clock next Friday. Take care.